Will you be remembered after you're dead? The Zedless Deadless podcast about obscure people from history with me, Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome to the Zedless Deadlist. I'm Izzy Lawrence and I really like this episode. Uh, not just because it features Emma Kennedy and that is actually Sue Perkins, you will hear, bringing us biscuits and licorice. It was weird. We did it in uh, Emma Kennedy's back garden and we just sat in her back garden so you can hear the planes going over, you can hear the birds, you can hear the occasional yap and the occasional Sue Perkins bringing us stuff. However, uh it's also interesting in terms of its content, not just its location. As I say, I'm a huge fan of Emma Kennedy. She writes amazingly. Uh, if you've got kids, get her books. They're really good. And also, um, she's filthy, which is which is lovely. Um, Richard Herring fans will know her from AI Ottoma. And you will also know her if you're a fan of MasterChef. She won Celebrity MasterChef. And if... You basically like comedy. You will recognise her lovely, lovely face. And, uh, yeah, I was just so happy that I got her to speak at the British Museum for um, the live show. That was a boon. And then she wanted to come and do the podcast too. I was very, very happy. So, but the history. The history is the important bit. And what's really interesting about this episode is it sort of challenges my prejudices because I am a very middle-class Guardian reading person who thinks that fame is slightly trashy and I would never lure myself to certain things. And yeah, this this lady, she was a fame seeker. She was like Tara Para, Mamara, Para, Tompkinson, King Kardashian and Katie Price all mixed into one. And yet she was brilliant and she made a huge difference to all of our lives and we've never heard of her. It's weird. Anyway... So enjoy this. It is a fascinating talk on feminism, on singing, on orphans, on murder and on nuns and also dousing composers in water. There's a lot to there's a lot to interest you here. I hope you enjoy. I say, Emma, please talk about an obscure person from history and you come back with Georgina Weldon. Georgina Weldon. And why? Why that person? Anybody you could have picked? I well, I, she to me was interesting because I think we are currently living in an age where reality TV stars mm. are, you know, they they are arguably more famous than people with actual talent. Says the lady who won MasterChef. <laughs> Says the lady who won MasterChef. Um, but it's like if you think about Kim Kardashian, mm. she, she she's the prime example. So we're in this weird era of, of elevating ostensibly normal people for nothing, in a way. And that sort of feels like that's a modern um, construct, but actually it isn't, because Georgina Weldon sort of beat the lot of them. And also the other thing that really grabbed me about Georgina is that she was the first feminist, bef- and she preceded the suffragettes, and people don't know about her and she is the reason uh, that women can divorce their husbands and she is the reason um, that there is a, a, a court of appeal yeah. and nobody met, nobody's heard of her I know and the, the, the amazing story about you know it used to be that you had to have sex yeah. With your partner. You had to have sex with your partner. Conjugal rights, yeah. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, but really, and the reason why I've picked her is, is that she, she was sort of Britain's first feminist. Um, she uh, preceded the suffragettes by a, at least half a century. Actually, at the tail end of her life, she was actually taken to uh, a meeting where uh, she saw the suffragettes and she was really unimpressed with them because she just thought, what the fuck have they done? They, they've done nothing that I've done, which we will now see. Um, so she, she was a woman that was thwarted by every single man she ever met. And this story I'm going to tell you, um, there's going to be intrigue, there's going to be murder, there's going to be orphans, there's going to be catastrophic lesbian affairs... Um, there's going to be lunacy and there's going to be scandal because Ge- Georgina Weldon was basically the woman who never gave up. So, yeah, yeah. so she, she was a trailblazer. Mm. And um, it, it just struck me that, that she was at, just fitted your brief 
Yeah. Perfectly. And how did you hear And she's funny you? as well. Yeah, she's it really was funny. funny. How how did so where did you pick her so up? So I um gosh now, this would have probably been about twenty years ago. Mm. Yeah, maybe about twenty years ago. Um I was working on a show called uh this morning with Richard, not Judy. I know that show. And the director of that show is a man called Gareth Karivik, mm-hmm. uh, who is sadly no longer with us. And he gave me this book called A Monkey Among Crocodiles. Amazing. Sue Perkins has just brought us She biscuits. just brought us baked goods, what, which what, seems appropriate. What has she brought? Um, I don't know. But they look... Are they, hang on. Perks? Perks. Are they? This is just a mysterious biscuit. What are they? That's part of the Odyssey. That's part of the Odyssey. She okay. shouted. Up we the we can tell. Hang on. Tell me first. Tell me, and then we'll have one, and yeah. we'll work it out. Okay. So he gave me this book, A Monkey Among Monks Crocodiles, mm-hmm. uh, quite rightly knowing that I would love every single page of it, and it starts so brilliantly um, with her arriving at the nunnery. And she's got two bedraggled pugs, um, some birds in a cage, and a monkey called Mr. Titalihi. Oh, look, now she's brought licorice. She's brought the licorice. identifying box. Oh my god, look, it's amazing. I mean, this is. I mean, listen to that. That's proper policy that licorice, that is. And they that's are. That's proper full on licorice. Barley and oat crumble biscuits. Um, yes, yeah, so monkey might. So it begins. It begins, and it's slashing with rain. And she's standing outside a nunnery in France, and with her, she's got two pugs, um, some caged birds, and a monkey called Mister Titalihi. <laughs> and uh, she's knocked on the door, and a nun has answered. And, and and Georgina just says, "I am an excessively popular person." Um, but time has come to settle all scores. That was exactly what she said as she arrived at the nunnery. And so the nuns take her in. And, and Georgina pretends to be religious for about six months. She just pretends to be religious. And she's not remotely religious. And she sort of, they make her wear a sort of a, a nun's outfit, but she zhuzhes it up with a sash. <laughs> and um, and j- just spent most of her time, instead of sort of doing any sort of Bible study, just sorting out the vegetable patch. Which but is useful. Her, which I is see, useful. Yeah. But her main reason for going to the nunnery uh, was because she wanted to settle all scores. And she sat down and started to write her memoirs that I believe in their original form ran, ran to seven volumes. And they were only published in French because they were so libelous, they couldn't be ever published in England. I love that. So we'll now go 30 years back. And uh, Georgina was born into a family that was sort of very much on the fringes of um, sort of high society. And she had a domineering father uh, who's called Morgan Traherne, and, and his life had been a sort of series of bitter disappointments, but he had one aim, and that was to marry his daughter off for a small fortune. And she did have an opportunity to marry well. well. And there was a brilliant man who was called Poodle Bing, who was sort of uh, very much part of, of, of um, the court of Queen help. Victoria. Poodle and Bing, Poodle of Bing. He was. Yeah, Poodle, if, if, you, if you're listening to this, go and Google Poodle Bing and you can find a picture of Poodle Bing and he looks like a Poodle Bing. If PoodleBing.com has not been bought, oh, I want to buy I it, actually. But it's B-Y-N-G, don't be fooled. Um, yeah. And, um, and he, he was infamous. He was an, just basically an absolutely useless toff. Mm. That's what he was absolutely useless exactly toff. marriage material and he w- he'd been given a job once to look after the king and queen of i think it was the isle of sandwich mm. and all he had to do was look after them for a fortnight and he took them somewhere where there was a terrible flu outbreak mm-hmm. and they caught flu and died <laughs> and then he thought oh shit what am i going to do <laughs> so he put them in barrels of rum of course to preserve them and then sent them on a ship back to the island from whence they came, and the ship sank. 
Hey, he was just a useless top. That's amazing. So anyway, so Poodle's job was to basically try and introduce Georgina to somebody who was going to be mm. a good match and was going to, you know, uh, mean that she had w- was going to re- live the rest of her life in the manner to which she had become accustomed. She she was a classic person. She was one of those classic people who had ideas above their station in the old-fashioned sense. Mm. That I think in her head. She thought that she should have been a prince. You know, she could have had a shot at being a princess. And um, and whereas, she certainly thought she was beautiful. Oh, she absolutely thought she was beautiful. Mm. Um, and I mean, you know, we've seen the pictures. She she's at very best. <laughs> you there, the plain girl, isn't yeah. she? At at tops, yeah. tops. Here is a portrait uh, that she had commissioned of her, so history could remember her. There she is. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is what she actually looked like. It's like the worst Tinder ever, isn't it? Okay. So she was sort of going to, she was sort of being seen in all the well to do parlours, let's put it that way, in the well to do parties. and. Um, in order to try and find a husband. And somebody did step forward and, and who was, I think he was a Duke or something, or he, you know, he had really good prospects. And her father was like, yeah, you know, come on, this is the guy you're going to marry. And instead, she ran off with um, a, a soldier from the, the Hazars yeah. uh, called Harry Weldon, eloped and married him. And sort of basically overnight, she was cut, uh, she was cut off penniless from her family um, she was forbidden from going to any of the, the posh parlours that she had been accustomed to going to so pretty much by by the time they had been on, got married gone away on a honeymoon and come back her life was ruined mm. that was it, it was and over it, before it even is, begun and it wasn't even worth it so she was desperate to wheedle her way back into um, society. So she decided to open an academy of singing in Charles Dickens's old house um, in Tavistock Square. And to publicise it, she embarked on a Beauty and the Beast tour with her best student, who was called Gwendolyn Jones. And uh, it was remarkable in the fact that, that, that she decided that she was the beauty. Remember, we've seen the picture... She was the beauty, but, but even though Gwendolyn was 20 years her junior, um, it was a critical and financial disaster. Um, hardly anybody came, and the people who did, they were more interested in chatting rather than listening. And in fact, the chatting was so bad that the accompanist slammed the lid down on the piano, and he hadn't just left the stage uh, uh, while Georgina carried on singing. He actually left town before she... <laughs> Before she stopped, that's the sort of woman she was. So basically, she needed a miracle. She needed a miracle. So here comes, here comes Gounod. Now he's quite a, a famous French composer. You might have heard of him. Has anyone heard of him? Yeah. Okay. Because she she was basically trying to become famous. She wanted to be a famous singer. She thought she had real real talent mm. and that she should be a famous mm. opera singer and that that's where the, the French no composer Simon Cowell, really, sort of say. no she, exactly she she would she would have probably got on the last 12 okay. for X Factor that's pretty good but but, but but she would have been the joke act mm. and she would have been gone first week yeah. and you would never have remembered her ever again but this is where the, the famous French composer comes in because he, um, he, she happened to find herself in a room in which he was playing at the piano and um, he was very taken with her and she sort of hid behind a curtain and, and downed uh, some, a, a shot of something very alcoholic and then came out sort of giggling and, and weeping. And in the space of one afternoon... Um, she managed to basically persuade him that, that she was his muse from here on in. So suddenly she'd gone from nothing to absolutely everything. Guno suddenly turns up at the house in Tavistock Square. Remember, Harry is, is still living there, living there together. And he says he's left his wife and he's come to live with, live with them. 
So he moves in and he wants and expects sex. And Georgina then has to persuade him that what Guno thinks is passion is actually indigestion. <laughs> and so she makes him have constant cold baths. He has to be wrapped in Indian rubber and left in a room that's heated to 60 degrees. And then she has to throw very cold buckets of water over him, which apparently she did with great gusto. Um, so the net result was uh, Guno got dysentery and uh, her husband moved out. But they had a tempestuous relationship. Mm. Well, I can imagine. When, I mean, living with your yeah, husband it was, it was, and it was your madness. lover, it was but his or lover. It was madness. And, and then he wrote, I think it was called Polyucte. I don't know how you pronounce that properly. Mm. But it was his masterpiece. Mm. And he had one um, copy of it. And he announces that he's leaving. And she obviously thinks that this masterpiece is her ticket to fame and fortune. And so she's absolutely determined that he's not leaving with it. Wow. And so they had they had a physical wrestling match. <laughs> Literally, I think it lasted for about half an hour where they were just fighting physically over who was was had had hold of of the manuscript. And she sat on him, and then he gave up. So she she kept the manu so she had the manuscript. I think it took him about ten years to get it back. So she basically also invented Brazilian Jiu Jitsu before I mean, the Gracies. Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the Singing Academy was not going well. Gwendolyn Jones had died, um, and so Georgina turned her attention to to some orphans. So she went out and got ten. And then uh, four more turned up. Uh, they'd, they'd been taught to play the bells by a blind man in Lambeth. <laughs> and she decided that they'd be raised as vegetarians um, and that every day would start with half an hour of organised screaming uh, to, get, to get the naughtiness out of them. Uh, <laughs> and every Monday, uh, she would, this is all true, every Monday, every Monday she would parade the orphans on a milk cart with her name emblazoned across it because basically she was just desperate just to be slightly, you know, to be known by anybody. She was absolutely desperate for it. Now, at this point, she, uh, 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 a couple enter her life, uh, the Meniers. And Anarchis uh, Menier was... Um, he, he was sort of an overweight, unhealthy man, had lank hair, uh, very bad hygiene, uh, sort of a bloodless, horrible complexion. And he had a wife uh, called Angèle, who Georgina took, took, took a great uh, fancy to. And, and she was uh, sort of a short, dumpy blonde. She had a nickname, uh, which was the human cormorant because of her incredible, incredible appetite. Now, the Meniers that, that were, were actually con artists. They were con artists, and, and poor Georgina didn't know about this. She moved them into the house. She was particularly interested in Angèle, and uh, they became a couple here. And, but Menier, of course, has seen Georgina coming, so he started to sell her stolen furniture, and, uh, and then he ends up selling her a hot air balloon, uh, which, which she puts in their front garden for no reason. But anyway, now Menier had a plan. His plan was, was to steal the house in Tavistock Square. That was the plan. The, the plan was that Ar Angèle would take Georgina to Paris and they would live there together and they would concentrate on Georgina's singing. That was what they, they told her. And Georgina, she was electrified uh, at this prospect. He thought this, this was absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, and Menier, it, he was so evil, he sort of even feigned upset and said, oh, really? You're all going to Paris and you're just going to leave me here with all the money and the house? He couldn't wave them off quick enough, basically. Now, in France, so they get to France, and Georgina sets up a new orphanage in Angèle's sister Marie's house. But this was when Angèle and Marie sort of kicked in phase two of the massive swindle that they wanted to bring about. Marie then told Georgina that Angèle had TB. And this came as some news because Angèle looked like she was in rude health, uh, at which point they would start 
pro you know, producing handkerchiefs that had little bits of red on them. And Marie, <laughs> Marie said that, that if Georgina didn't pay for Angèle to be in the country, she, she may as well be signing her death warrant, to which Georgina pointed out they were already in the country, uh, to which she was told, well, it's the wrong sort of heir. The, they, they couldn't quite go through with the swindle because one of the orphans died of measles and they had to sell another of the orphans who'd taken to making the more annoying children drink their own urine. <laughs> Back in London, Harry's thinking to himself, how do I get rid of my embarrassing wife? Harry, um, tried, Harry was having an affair. He mm -hmm. actually had a son, which she didn't find out about um, until I think the boy was about 13 or 14 and Ooh, she was God. absolutely knocked for six when she found out about that. Yeah. But um, he tried to, he, he was in a pickle because uh, you couldn't really get rid of your wife. There was only one way of doing it and that was to, to, to say that she, they, she was mad. Mm. So he tried to have her committed to a lunatic asylum. And it's not like she's got no symptoms. No, no, I know. I mean, she was eccentric. Yeah. But she wasn't insane. She wasn't insane. She was summoned back to Tavistock Square, and Meunier is is sort of dug in, and uh, and she has a, a, a massive fight with him. Um, at the house, at which point Meunier leaves the house with all of Georgina's possessions, every single one of them. And Harry's lawyer stops Georgina from um, doing anything about it, telling him that, that Meunier has been blackmailing Harry and saying that he's got letters uh, that reveal that Georgina will kill any child for a £1,000. It's all completely made up. Anyway, so uh, imagine it's a Sunday, okay? Tavistock Square, they're having a bit of a spring clean. Uh, Georgina's up a ladder doing the dusting. And two men arrive at the front door. And one, uh, they, they, they say they're called Shell and Stewart, uh, but they're not. Their real names were uh, Dr. Wynne and Dr. Forbes Wilson, and, and they were mad doctors. And uh, they were there to basically take... Uh, Georgina away and they came in pretending that they were spiritualists and uh, they sat uh, Georgina down and talked about spiritualism for a bit and then they left and, and as far as they were concerned that was it that was all they needed to prove she was a lunatic they were completely unscrupulous Georgina sort of standing there thinking what was all that about and then this sort of cold chilly realization comes upon her and she thinks hang on a minute there's something going on here next thing she knows a landau has pulled into uh, full uh, through the front gates and the two uh, doctors come out and they've got with them nurses and they've got shackles and they're ready to go her first instinct wasn't to flee for her life her first instinct was to sit down and write a letter of complaint to the prime minister he didn't reply. Uh, to bless her, uh, she still thought that this was something to do with Menye. It didn't even occur to her that Harry would have done this to her. Um, so what she did was she barricaded herself in the library in the house uh, with a police rattle and three litres of water. The doctors got into the house. They, they pushed in. They were trying to, to um, get upstairs. And she managed to shout out of the window to a police officer to say that there, there were people trespassing in her house. And the policeman came in and there was a big kerfuffle and he got them out of the house. And at that point, she was told that they had an order to commit her that had been signed by Harry. And she was absolutely devastated. But she jumped out of the window in her slippers, leapt into a cab. She had set, because if you had a committal order, you had seven days to avoid it. So she had to lie low for seven days. She'd avoided going to the asylum by an absolute whisker, but it gave her this sort of Joan of Arc moment, and she wrote, A wife has no recourse against her husband. She cannot bring a complaint against him for conspiracy, defamation, imprisonment, or assault and battery in a civil court. If it pleases the husband to ruin her, she has no legal right to complain. Against any other man or woman, she has her remedy. Against her husband, nothing of the kind. So she basically decided that, that lunacy reform needed a heroine and she was going to be it. The last part of her life was now set and she sort of resolved that if any man ever crossed her ever again, she was going to fight them with every last breath in her body. And she sort of wanted retribution on a biblical scale. Um, you know, she, she was going to systematically take everyone down. 
on another level, she had succeeded because society, when they were now absolutely uh, fascinated with her. And like whenever lunacy law uh, or reform was discussed, she w was um, uh, uh, you know, a star turn. She also realised, of course, that she could cash in uh, on the publicity. So she started giving talks uh, every two weeks with a song at the end that nobody <laughs> particularly wanted. Uh, fringe societies and free thinkers started to embrace her. Um, James Salbury, who is the founder of the first vegetarian restaurant in London, absolutely loved her, as did the, the Rational Dress Society, which were women who refused to wear corsets, up the women. Um, so she sort of became this a, a pin-up girl for free spirits and, and, and anti-establishment figures. And she was only the second person ever to manage to to avoid going in to a lunatic asylum. And again, she changed all the rules about that because she sued everyone involved in trying to send her to the lunatic asylum. And she discovered that once you were in a lunatic asylum, um, it, th there was some small legal thing which meant you couldn't get out of the lunatic asylum. She also found out that the people who were committing people to the lunatic si asylums had a fi financial interest in the lunatic asylum. So it was all corrupt. Um, so she unpicked all of that all on her own. Wow. I mean, she, she was a hell of a woman. She, she took over 100 people to court. Um, the, 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 for 15 years, all she did was sue people who had fucked her over. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, 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 the press caught on to this. If, if there was a slow news day, ed editors would say, what's, what's Mrs. Weldon up to today? She was absolutely notorious. And although some of the members of the press treated her as a joke, the public absolutely did not. You know, for the public, you know, this was a... A, a, a woman who was clearing her name and reputation and being fearless in a way that was extremely modern. So they were really fascinated by it. She used to get letters from all over the world and they would just be addressed to Mrs. Weldon London and they would get to her. So it's, it's extraordinary that, that we don't know who she is anymore. But um, more important, what, in, the important bit of what she did was she fundamentally changed the law on, on several things, certainly for lunacy. Um, she uncovered a piece of law um, that revealed that, that someone who signed an order for committal to an asylum had no power under law to revoke it. So basically, you could put someone away, but you couldn't get them out again. So she changed that. She also discovered that asylums were run for profit, um, and she put a stop to that. But her most significant legal victory was actually against Harry in Weldon versus Weldon. So she had um, sued him for a restitution of ch conjugal rights, which basically, you have to sleep with me or you go to jail. This is actually... <laughs> that was genuinely how it worked. And, um, so th and that was patently absurd. And um, so the, it brought about the Weldon Relief Act... <laughs> uh, which took away the power of attachment which meant that no husband could imprison their wife and of course it went both ways so Harry didn't have to go to jail but, but Georgina had single-handedly completely changed women's uh, rights um, her her infamy wasn't quite at an end uh, because she was a bit of a, 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 a hothead and um, she was uh, found guilty of criminal libel and was sent to jail uh, for six months, hard labour. She went to Holloway, uh, she had a goldfish and she kept a newt, which she fed on mints. And she wrote a play. Um, <laughs> that's her. And, and when she was released, she was dragged by jubilant supporters to, to Speaker's Corner, where she was met by a crowd of 17,000 people. And... Um, you know, she was absolutely adored. And, and afterwards, she, she toured the provinces with a play called Not Alone that was absolutely dreadful. Um, and she appeared in music halls and she was invited to the House of Lords uh, to debates. And, and, and more importantly, her face was on every single bus in London. There you go. She was the, the face of Pear's Soap uh, for a while. <laughs> I would have loved to have met her. Yeah, no, I would have. Because as well. 
I think the the thing that really stands out about her is how single-minded she was. And she was a woman who was ambitious at a time when being ambitious was not allowed no. for women. And not allowed to admit it either. No, so just you absolutely to... not allowed. <gasps> there he goes. That's very cute. Um, that was the Robin. Yeah. Um... But yeah, and she was determined and she never gave up. She never gave up. And you think about all the, the ups and the downs. I mean, she just was knocked for six, knocked for six, knocked for six, knocked for six, time and time and time and time again. And she never gave up. She even did gardening. Yeah, she yeah. never gave up. It's beautiful. I mean, I mean, it's beautiful, but she was... I mean, she is all aspects of the sort of, you know, Guardian reading people like me disapprove of, which is yes. fame for fame's sake and everything yes. else. I mean, we do, we don't, yes. we shouldn't like her, should we? Really? Should we disapprove? No, I, of her? I, am, I imagine if, I, I imagine we would be thoroughly irritated by her. I mean, she, she was partly a joke. Mm. I mean, certainly newspaper editors treated she, her as if she was a joke, but, but the thing that's interesting is that the general public did not treat her as a joke she was certainly towards the end of her uh, sort of about the midpoint of her life she did suddenly find herself in the position that she had always wanted to be and that she was famous and not only was she famous she was adored so do you know who she's reminding me of who katie price yes i I would have said that yeah Yeah. because she was you know all the sort of weird marriages and not setbacks and everything yeah. else, and then yeah. comes back yet another series. Yeah, if Katie, if Katie Price had had significantly changed the law mm. on something that meant everything going forward was significantly improved for the lot of women, then yes. Here's the sad, but here's a sad ending. Bit of a sad ending. She so she'd let her guard slip. She'd been a bit busy. And Angèle took advantage of sort of her her flitting mind and she persuaded Georgina, uh, they'd moved to a new house in Gower Street and and she persuaded uh, Georgina to to put the house in Angèle's name, which Georgina happily did. And nine days after Georgina had done that, Angèle had her evicted. And Georgina was absolutely heartbroken and she didn't know what to do and a friend offered to go and shoot her. Um, but Georgina said, no, it's a bit much. Uh, so what she did was she packed all of her papers into 27 tea chests and took her two pugs and her cage birds and Mr. Titalihi, the monkey, and went to the convent in France where she unpacked all of the 27 chests and wrote her memoirs, uh, which, which turned out to be eight volumes... Uh, which could only be published in France because they were so libelous. Um, but that is Georgina Weldon's uh, disastrous life. But um, it, it seems to me that, that a woman who single-handedly changed lunacy laws forever that meant that women could no longer be put away and, uh, 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 and also at the... Um, uh, when she went to jail, people were so incensed, they created the, the Court of Criminal Appeal. So we have the Court of Appeal because of Georgina Weldon. Um, so her achievements are enormous. Do you think that Georgina was doing that for her sake? Or for I think the... it was for revenge. I think she was driven by revenge. See, that's quite nice, isn't absolutely, it? Improvement via hate. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> one-track mind revenge. Wow. Mm. I mean, you know that that she she was quite open about that. It was everyone who has crossed me. I am now going to fuck you over. Nice. That was it. Yeah. And she, she did. Yeah, which is and she did. Terrifying. She didn't care. She didn't give a shit. Mm. You know, she went to she went to jail twice for libel for criminal libel twice. Wow. She couldn't. She clearly was somebody who could not control her temper. See, also, I'm getting Trump in this. This is. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a good thing that Twitter wasn't. Alive oh, Georgina Weldon on Twitter would have been quite something. She'd I have think. had. A, she'd have had her blue tick taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
if you want to find out more please visit izzy.com big thank you to emma kennedy uh for the interview and to sue perkins for the biscuits i am continuing my endeavors to put as many of these out as possible but my endeavors are rubbish uh mainly because i'm writing at the moment oh announcements oh maybe mm, not for ages but mm, this is currently writing and this is like the slowest part of the process but mm, it's happening so please do uh, keep in touch. Uh, there's a Facebook page, edlessdeadless.com. Join that. Please share the episodes. Also, if you haven't listened to all the episodes, there are some doozies. Do do check those out. Get in touch with me on Twitter. I'm at I-S-Z-I underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E at Izzy Lawrence. And I'm also, what else am I? I'm also on Instagram. You can follow me, follow my stories. Watch me tear my hair out writing. Yeah, everything, everything is good. But that episode was great. And persistence, man. Persistence and revenge. The best motivators. We'll see you next month. You've been listening to the Zedless Deadless podcast with me, Izzy Lawrence. To find out more, please visit izzy.com. That is I-S-Z-I dot com. For more information... No, I can't remember what to say now. I don't suppose anybody listens to this bit anyway. If you are listening to this bit, well done you. You're like proper. Like I say, do as much as you can to support me. You can actually donate via PayPal as well on the website. That would be great if you could do that. Anyway, I will speak to you guys soon. Boom!